nobody does things like this by themselves. I mean, we all, and everybody has help. So I just want to be very grateful and thankful to all of them. The definition of a trailblazer clearly is they blaze a trail. And honestly, what the real definition is, is a really old person that has to wear glasses <laughs> to see her notes so she doesn't forget them. <laughs> That's really what it is. But when you're a trailblazer, you make your own path. And there are a lot of people in this room that have made their own paths and are going to continue to make their own path. There are some people in here that may really not care much about the history of our sport uh, because you came along at a time where things are very good and you have everything you've ever wanted and people like Bill and I worked really hard for that to happen for you. And so we're very proud of that and very happy for you. But I do want to share just a little bit of the history. And unfortunately, I won't bore you with a lot of it, but a little bit of my own because everybody in this room had a dream when they started playing sports, if they played sports. And we all had different dreams. And depending on when you were uh, starting, your dream is completely different probably than mine. I don't see very many people in here that would have been trying to play sports in the 1960s. Most of you weren't even born by then. So I want to go backwards just a little bit because we all view our dreams as the most important thing in the world. And, and I certainly did. When I was uh, 10 years old, there were no opportunities for girls and women in sports in, in the state of Illinois, which is where I'm from and really not very many places in the whole country. Our exposure to sports was on television, and for me, it was watching the St. Louis Cardinals play baseball. And so my whole life, I thought I was gonna grow up and be a pitcher for the Cardinals because I didn't even associate gender at the time. Uh, I just knew that I could beat all the boys in the neighborhood, and I felt like, okay, I could do that too. And that was my dream, was to one day you know, be able to be a professional athlete. My other dream was you got to see the Olympic Games whenever they were on television. You never got to see softball back then, but you, every kid had a dream that they might be an Olympian someday. And so that too was one of my dreams. And then what's the biggest game of the year that they play on TV in every sport? It's the national championship. And that too was a dream for me, even when I was, you know, really, really young. When I was 10, I made the boys little league team in my little town of 700 people. And the night I was gonna get to play, the women's club said that girls cannot play with boys because there was some, something different about us. And I ran home and cried for like three days and my mom then made my dad start a softball team for my sisters and I. And I don't know that you can really call that something that I was a trailblazer in, but my parents certainly were at that time, and they gave me an opportunity of a lifetime. And in order to play ASA back then, you had to be 12, so they lied about my age so that I could play. <laughs> Unfortunately, you had to do that back then in order to get opportunities. When I got into high school, there were no sports. The closest I could get was to be a cheerleader. I could get on the field, I could be on the court, I could be around the athletes that I grew up with, uh, but I will tell you, I have no trail to blaze for being a cheerleader. <laughs> that was not my fun time. But in my senior year in high school, I found out from a friend of mine that you could play competitive sports in college. She was a year ahead of me, and she got to play in her freshman year, and I thought, well, I could do that. You know, that's, that's an opportunity. Well, we didn't have a lot of money. So I went with my dad to his um, credit union and I took out a bank loan to go to college to play sports. Unfortunately, that's the only reason I wanted to go. I didn't really care about studying. I hate to say that, but that's the truth. I just wanted to go and play sports because you could compete. And, and that was something I dreamt about doing my whole life. So I took out a bank loan and I went to college two years before Title IX. And for those of you that don't know Title IX, that was when the law was passed and that men and women in athletics had to be treated equally. Unfortunately, 
In my four years there, I played three sports and started almost every single game. Never got one penny of a scholarship because a lot of the schools weren't able to fund it until like in the 80s. And then they were able to start giving scholarships for the women. So did it change my opinion of my experience? No. I just appreciated it even more that I got the opportunity to play. It took me 20 years to pay my bank loan back, but every penny of it was worth it to do that. When I graduated, I became a high school PE teacher because that was the only way you could become a coach in the 70s. And they didn't have girls sports. So I went to the principal, I said, I really want to start a girls sports program and compete with the other schools. And he's like, okay, yeah, that's fine. We can't pay you and you have to drive a bus. So I got my school bus driver's license. We had five girls teams and I coached all of them. And it about killed me for three years, but it was something that gave those young, young girls an opportunity to see really how good they could be. And I have absolutely no regrets. It all sounds like it's really a sad time, right? And I'm not trying to make it be that. I want you to understand that those challenges led me to one of my first dreams, which was to be able to be a pro ball player in St. Louis. It just wasn't with the Cardinals. It was with the Hummers. And it was an experience of a lifetime. And fortunately, unfortunately, maybe statistically, but fortunately for me, I got to pitch against Joan Joyce at least 12 times in those three years. And we didn't beat them very often, maybe once out of all those times, but what, what an opportunity, you know, to be able to pitch against the very best. Uh, someone that I looked up to, and who was a trailblazer before me. <clears throat> so it was a great experience. Of course, it was a good summer job, and the only people who could play were school teachers, because we didn't work in the summer. So we, it was like a good summer job, you know, to be able to do that. I got burned out playing uh, or coaching five sports, especially when we didn't have a softball field or a track. So I don't know what we were supposed to do on that, but we did pretty well for that. But I decided to take a cut and pay and go to Eastern Illinois University and be a volleyball coach and be an assistant softball coach to Melinda Fisher, who ran your convention for you, who was at Illinois State. And I made it there for two years, and then my coach that coached me and Melinda, by the way, at Illinois State retired, and she asked me to come back and be the head softball coach, so I did. And Melinda came back as my assistant. And I was there six years, and then when I left, Melinda took over, and she's still there today. I retired way before she did, but I did get to work with her this fall and work with her pitchers, as I did when Tara was her assistant before she was hired. So you're right about the energy. She's got a lot of it. So anyway, I got to fulfill that, and then when I realized that there was a job open in California, who does not want to leave the Midwest in their lovely springs to go to California mm -hmm. to coach a sport? So I did, and I stayed there for 27 years at Fresno State. We were second in the nation three times, third three times, fifth three times, and finally in 1998, we were able to win the whole thing. And quite honestly, we were the last mid-major university to win a national championship, which is very sad to me because I think there are a lot of great mid-major programs that kind of get overlooked and <clears throat> My hope is that we, that path is still there for somebody to take it up, you know, in the future. We led the nation in attendance, and then we fought the Title IX battle to get the first stadium on a college campus. And we did have over 6,000 people when we played UCLA. And in the same year, we also hosted Arizona, and we had over 6,000 for that. And we held the record for many, many years until, of course, Oklahoma started going to the World Series. And then there was no hope you know, for us to, to hang on to that. So my second dream that I always wanted was to win a national championship, and we were able to accomplish that. Uh, when I went to Fresno State, I also was able to be a part of the USA softball. And for 10 years, I went to many countries, 
And um, all I have are gold medals because our players were so phenomenal and so much better than everybody else in the world. And they still are, really. And <clears throat> I got to be the first female head coach of a junior world team and of a world team. And that's really saying something for USA Softball, if any of you have followed it over the years, I know Bill has. And it's tough to get in, you know, into that. And I was very fortunate. I was also fortunate to be selected to go to Czechoslovakia in 1989 and try to convince Russia, Czechoslovakia, all the Eastern Bloc countries that they needed to vote yes for softball to get into the 96 Olympics. The vote was in 1992. I went there for 17 days and worked with all their teams, taught them how to play the sport, and was an ambassador from the United States to help them, you know, learn how to compete. And then I was there when the wall came down in East Germany and they made me leave the country and I couldn't finish my project, but they did vote it in, in 96. And I was very fortunate to be a part of that. Uh, I had five players that were on that team. It was in Atlanta, Georgia, and my whole family got to go. So there wasn't much better than that. And we won the gold medal. That was the most important thing. So I feel like I really have left a lot of trails and again, it sounds like I'm just talking about myself. I, all of this cannot be done without the athletes and the family and the friends and the opposing coaches and people that hold you to a different standard all the time. That's what makes you a trailblazer. It's not because of your record or anything like that. It is because you have led the way or picked up the way of other people and you've left it open for other people to be challenged, to take that over. In 2012, when I retired, I really didn't retire. I helped Melinda this year with her pitchers in the fall. I work with a couple of travel programs and I do a lot of clinics all over. And I'm hoping that I can still continue uh, to do what I love, which is softball. I never worked a day in my life, really. It was just fun. All of it was fun. Hard, but fun. Now I get to sit back and watch all of you other coaches play in great facilities, have great salaries that we fought very hard for, and now the challenge is to you. My challenge is who's gonna be next year's trailblazer out of this room? It's all right there for you. Just take charge of it and go get it. Thank you so much for this award. It means, means the world. Thank you.